You're most welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 12th of May. A little bit of a focus on the uh, the UK, a little bit on Europe and the United States today. And it has to be said, some interesting uh, or, and somewhat strange information coming out of the Centers for Disease Control, but more on that in a minute. Now, here's the COVID symptom study data. And we can see this nice downward trend, but the last few days, there has been a very slight increase in prevalence, 14,857 up slightly overall according to the COVID symptom tracker data, 17,381. Now, as you know, what I'm concerned about is the, the new variants, particularly the India variant. So we're going to have to keep a bit of an eye on that and see what happens. So these are the numbers in the UK, just over 2,000 to 2,500 new cases per day, officially diagnosed. Four deaths, 20 deaths yesterday, four deaths a day before, 127,000 deaths within 28 days of a diagnosis. That's the death certificate figure, 151,000 uh, cases. Now here we have the, uh, this is kind of the official slides that uh, are used on the Downing Street briefing. Chris Whitty goes through these. First one's pretty straightforward. It shows the increase in number of people vaccinated. The blue line, uh, one vaccine, uh, the the grey brownish area is it there, is uh, people have had two vaccines. And the number's going up in millions, so that's all pretty good. Then he showed this slide, which is the evidence of efficacy in vaccinated people. So here we have uh, symptomatic disease, <clears throat> hospitalizations, deaths. Now, Chris Whitty did not explain the difference between the dark brown and the light brown in these reductions. Uh, he seemed to skip over that. I think he might have got a bit confused. And it's not in the official government explanations either, but I think it's first dose uh, uh, and second dose. I think that's what it is. So after two doses, you get this greater reduction. But this is basically, the, thing, the reason it's confusing is they actually say after the first dose here, after one dose. But I think that's what this brown bit means as far as I can tell. Um, so reduction in symptomatic disease, 55 to 70% after one dose. Reduction in hospitalisation, 75 to 80% after one dose. And reduction in death, 75 to 80% after one dose. And as the darker brown, I believe, shows a greater reduction after after two doses of vaccine. Good graphic, but we could have done with a bit more explanation there from uh, from the government sources and from Chris Whitty when he gave the presentation. Uh, now, this, this is really quite important. So here we are, we're vaccinating over 40s. Now, this is deaths here. So, of course, it's going to prevent the vast majority of deaths. Still a few deaths there, it has to be said. Not insignificant, but it's going to prevent the vast majority of deaths. But this here is infection. So it's going to prevent these infections as we've seen, at least to a degree, but these ones it's not. So people under the age of 39 um, can still get infected because they have no vaccine protection at all. And of course, on the 17th of May, we've got quite a lot of opening up coming up in the UK. So that means we will see an increase in infections in the under 39s uh, or the under 40s after the 17th of May. That is unfortunately is inevitable. Now, I'm not expecting it to feed through into deaths because there's a small number of deaths in that age group, but it doesn't alter the fact we are going to see an increase in cases. That is, uh, that's inevitable, I'm afraid. Um, number of people in hospital with COVID-19 in the UK, again, we see a nice, fairly, uh, fairly dramatic and sustained reduction. And let's hope that COVID symptom tracker data that was showing a slight uh, increase in cases over the past few days is just uh, is just an anomaly. Now, the, the other useful slide, they didn't show on the press briefing, but I've got it here. It's quite useful. Um, summary of evidence on vaccine effectiveness against different outcomes. Now, the green means that we're sure. Uh, the amber means that we've uh, got medium confidence and uh, low confidence in the uh, the light pink colour is it so um, and of course this is the way the data is coming in so uh, first dose symptomatic disease fifty five to seventy percent protection with the Pfizer BioNTech exactly the same as with the Oxford hospitalisation protection after the first dose seventy five to eighty five percent exactly the same as with the Oxford but of course the data is not yet in for the Oxford AstraZeneca because we started doing the Pfizer before 
and we do see these gratifyingly high figures although the data for that is not firmed up yet it will soon but i mean that that slide there is clear evidence of the uh of the efficacy of the vaccination program so that is that, that that's looking pretty good um now moving on the vaccination figures we know they're pretty good now in in the uk uh these figures are for those over 18 whereas i prefer the method of the united the way that the united states does it actually their figures are for the whole population but these are just over 18s in the uk and likewise for the second dose over 18s the adult population now just looking at europe generally things are getting better in europe but france um, now, France do not have, it has to be said, particularly good genomic monitoring for a sophisticated country. Their genomic analysis is relatively weak. But nevertheless, they've detected um, 20 cases of the India variant, five clusters. And that's a few days ago. Uh, Health Minister <clears throat> reopening bars, restaurants and outdoor service on the 19th of May. Vaccines in France, well, 26.6% of the population have had one dose compared to the UK where it's 67.6%. So vaccination programmes picking up in Europe, but still pretty uh, slow. Obviously, we know that cases have been going down in France, therefore there's less poorly people. So as of last Saturday, just over 5,000 people in intensive care, overall occupancy. Sunday down to 4,971, first drop below 5,000 since March. So it's going down, it's going down, but uh, of course there's this tale of poorly people and unfortunately a tale of death as cases go down but we're still concerned about the India variant with the opening up and the low vaccination numbers we've got three factors there that make it a bit of an unknown situation in France and indeed in other European countries now moving on to the United States the numbers are going down in the states albeit slowly so deaths are going down and cases are going down but fairly slowly um, I won't put the latest figures up but they're all there now, the US Food and Drug Administration expanded emergency use authorization of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine from 12 to 15 year olds. Now, this is the first country in the world to do so. So, adolescents now eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. And as time goes on, I would expect them to become eligible for the Moderna and the Janssen, Johnson and Johnson vaccine as well. It's just this is where their data is at the moment. It's not saying there's an intrinsic uh, benefit with the Pfizer vaccine or an intrinsic deficit with the others. It's just where the data is up to. The same as those efficacy figures we've just looked at for the UK. Uh, Janet Woodcock, I think she's acting director of the FDA, if memory serves, allows for a younger population to be protected, bringing up, bring us closer to return to a sense of normal, normalcy, ending the pandemic. Now, this is somewhat important for the individuals but it's also very important for herd immunity but uh, fda do want to point out that between 1st of march 2023 to april 2021 one and a half million cases of covid19 in 11 to 17 year olds so these people are by no means immune so they get two doses three weeks apart the same as the adult pfizer regime now i must say i'm a little bit surprised about this the way I understand the immunology is I would have thought you'd get a better overall immune response with a longer gap. But this is the way it stayed uh, since the clinical trials all the way through uh, by the FDA. The thing is, you make the antibodies quite quickly, but things like the T cells and, 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 the, and the B cells and the memory cells take a bit longer to make. But that, that's the way it's done in the States. I don't quite understand their immunological rationale uh, the position in the uk does seem more scientifically uh, reasonable to me but um that they they've probably got sophisticated reasons that i'm not privy to now the fda are saying that the potential benefits of this vaccine in individuals 12 years of age uh, and older outweigh the known and potential risks so what they're saying here as i read this is the risk of the having the disease for someone 12 to uh 12 to 17, um, 11 to 17, or adolescents, basically. Uh, that, that one's, um, yeah, it's 12 to 15, the latest data, isn't it? Uh, they're, they're saying that the individual has a greater risk if they got COVID-19 than if they have the vaccine. So they're accepting the herd immunity, of course, um, but they're saying that it's protective for the individual. 
as well. Which is, is good. So that, that seems to be the rationale they're predicating that decision on. So that rollout should have started now. And uh, of course, it'll be interesting to, uh, to follow that up. Now, I, I can't pretend this isn't a bit curious. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, scientific brief, uh, 7th of May, just a few days ago. Uh, read it for yourself. sars coronavirus 2 is transmitted by exposure to infectious respiratory fluids. People release respiratory fluids. Uh, infection depends on concentration of viral particles. Well, they've released this on the 17th of May, but the rest of us have known this for about a year or, or more now. So it does seem a bit strange that they're releasing this now. Are they seeking to clarify um, have they just caught up? I can't believe they've just caught up. Um, maybe they're seeking to clarify. I don't know. Three principal ways of transmission, inhalation, mucous membrane deposition, and touching uh, mucous membranes with contaminated hands. So that's uh, like a dirty surface with a virus on up to the mucous membranes. So inhalation into the airways and droplets landing on the mucous membranes. So that would be droplets getting in the nose the eyes and the mouth now they now say that these two are the primarily that this is the most important virtually all the infections are caused by this so this is still there they're saying that's there but it is third so it looks like um, hand washing is still important disinfecting surfaces is still important but way way less important than these two so no one's going to say stop washing your hands, but it is less important than the inhalation and deposition of viral particles on mucous membrane route. Now, I don't think there's anything we didn't know there, but so we'll accept the clarification. Let's not be cynical about it. The clarification is good. Uh, factors in inoculum. Now, inoculum is the number of viruses that someone is someone is infected with, and that determines whether they're going to get the infection or not. And what no one has said definitively yet, it depends, it also probably is going to influence how severe an illness someone gets, although no one seems to have written that down. But the idea that you get a few hundred particles and get a mild illness, or you get a few billion particles and get a more severe illness, is probably true, um, but it's not, it's never been published yet. Anyway, talking about the, the, the dose of particles, it depends on the airstream, Thermal layering, of course, the hot air can rise, and initial jetting of exhalations. That's how much you spit it out. When so we said back in January, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. But for example, we know that people talking quietly will um, have less momentum in, in their droplets. Therefore, the virus those droplets can contain. Whereas people like shouting, um, it's it's much more, much much more. They talk about enclosed spaces. Uh, increased exhalation and prolonged exposure so increased exhalation could be singing for example and the amount of time people are exposed for now we have been worried about a lot of outdoor activities i remember we were worried about um the, the in the protests that were in the united states that there could be outdoor transmission but there doesn't seem to have been hardly any outdoor transmission the vast majority of transmission has been indoors in closed spaces and as we now know from other data, it doesn't say this, but the virus can be suspended in the air, aerosolized for three hours. And of course, we've been talking about this for a year, well, a year we're about, we've been talking about increasing ventilation, but now it's become official. So quite, I suppose they just felt the need to clarify this. I don't really pretend to understand why they are so apparently behind the times on this. Um, World Health Organization are the same. I, I, I can't remember the date. You, you might you might remember. Do let me know if you remember it. But I remember, remember Dr. Tedros was saying in one of his briefings way back in early, first part of last year, I'm sure, he said this virus is airborne. And then it was actually quite comical. You could see Mike Ryan sitting next to him, writing him a note and sticking the note to him. Then the next time it was Dr. Tedros's turn to speak, he said, when I say airborne, I don't mean airborne as in paratroopers. So he was actually saying it's not airborne. It's not suspended in aerosolized particles there. But it is. He was wrong. He was right the first time. So was that a Freudian slip the first time where he actually said what he knew to be true? And, you know, it gets a bit confusing. It was a bit, it was a bit comical, actually. It was a bit like a farce. So Mike Ryan sent him this notion. He corrected himself. Not funny, of course, because people's lives are at stake. No accountability for the World Health Organization, of course. Uh, senior people that have made big errors are still in post. 
unfortunately. Um, progressive loss of viral viability and infectiousness. Temperature, and again, we've known this for ages, that the optimum temperature for viral survival is about 5 degrees centigrade. Much lower at 20 degrees centigrade, much lower at 40 degrees centigrade. We talked about this, oh, it must have been about last February, March, we talked about this. Humidity, we talked about that as well. That in lower humidity, the larger droplets with the virus in will dry out, become smaller droplets and suspended in the air for longer. Ultraviolet radiation, of course, kills the virus. Therefore, infection is still possible <coughs> more than six feet away. Because it can diffuse. And again, we talked about this a long, long time ago. So indoor, poorly ventilated settings are where this virus has been spreading. We've, we've been ranting about ventilation for, for years. It's just so, well, not for years, for over a year. You know, it's just so obvious. And yet they just seem to be making this official now. Passing through uh, a space that an infected person has left. So, for example, if uh, someone's at home, sick, um, and the paramedics or something come to pick them up, or indeed if a person has died and the undertakers come to pick them up, need to ventilate the area because the viruses can hang in the air for three hours. And this seems to be the CDC just acknowledging this. Uh, practically physical distancing, well-fitting masks, adequate ventilation, they are now stressing, uh, avoiding of crowded indoor spaces, they're now stressing. So... I don't pretend to understand why they're doing this so late, why they're so late to the party. But I did look at history. So CDC advised wearing masks on the 19th of um, April. World Health Organization advised wearing masks on the 17th of June. Now, I thought masks would be beneficial right back in January, February. But the reason I didn't say it loud and clear was because we had senior doctors telling us that masks were no good or that masks were actually harmful. So this was like the official guidance. But I actually went against, I remember the, I remember the date well, because I remember for some reason it's, it stuck in my mind, 17th of, 17th of March on this channel, we said masks are going to be a lot more useful than not wearing masks. And that was based on data from the United States, uh, research from the United States on the physical properties of aerosolized particles and droplets. CDC took another month. World Health Organization, of course, came to the party last of all, 5th of June. Incredible. But true. You know, you look at every picture from the 1918-19 pandemic and everyone's wearing masks. And yet we had our senior doctors and advisory bodies for January, February, March, um, into April, up to the 19th of April for the CDC and up to the 5th of June for the WHO saying, saying masks do more harm than good. Um, just incredible. Why didn't they learn anything from history? These are the people that are supposed to be our guardians. It's, um, and I, I, I feel bad about coming to the party as late as the 17th of March. Um, maybe I let myself be over-distracted by the official guidelines, but of course I can't really... I can give counter argument to the official guidelines, but of course I can't go against them because the government guidelines are essentially statutory items. Now, last thing today, um, this, I'm, I'm reluctant to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Just an article from The Guardian in the UK, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, 20 manufacturing partners around the world, brilliant, uh, with which it has shared COVID-19 vaccine technology and know-how. So this is well shared. This has allowed the India Serum Institute in Pune to supply 300 million doses so far to 165 countries because of this sharing of technology and uh, know-how from AstraZeneca. I don't have shares in AstraZeneca. I have no interest in this. I'm just reporting it. I'm aware it's on the edge of my competence level because it goes into economics. But everything I've written here is, is factual as I understand it from this, from, from this article. 90% uh, of India's vaccines so far has come from the Indian Serum Institute, which of course is, uh, no, no, what, sorry, what this means is 90% of India's vaccines so far have been the Oxford AstraZeneca style, based on their uh, technology and know-how sharing. And they've supplied so far 98% of the supply to COVAX. And I think, I think the, I think it's $3 a dose for the Oxford AstraZeneca, maybe slightly less. 
the pledge for non-profit basis for the duration. Now, I'm not saying AstraZeneca is perfect. I'm just, this is what this article is saying. AstraZeneca lost money for the first few months. Pfizer and Moderna are on course to make $45 billion, £32 billion pounds collectively from their coronavirus vaccine this year. So um, that's a direct quote from the article. So it is interesting. And of course, we, we hope that money that people are making from vaccines and potentially other medication has no influence on any other any other policies. So I'm going to leave that there to those of you that are better at economic matters than me. But there does seem to be, you know, quite quite a big quite a big difference there. Um, and I believe the the Janssen Johnson and Johnson vaccine is ten dollars a dose as well. So that one's quite cheap as well. Um, and it just seems uh, that the a lot of the adverse publicity has been about the uh, the, the less expensive uh, vaccines. So we'll leave that there. But it's interesting and food for thought uh, and interesting that why is the CDC just published this so late? If you know, if you know from the States, let me know. I might be something missing something completely, utterly obvious about this. So to summarise, cases going down in the UK, starting to go down in Europe. A bit concerned about a resurgence in the UK after the 17th of uh, May. There will be one because of the unvaccinated younger people who will spread the infection to some extent. Uh, countries like France and other European countries, relatively poor genomic monitoring, risk of new variants come along, along. release of lockdown, low vaccination low vaccination levels could be a bad, could be a potentially bad triple whammy there. So basically we've got quite a bit of things that we don't know about the next few months in the in what we might call the West the Western world. And of course things are carrying on at a great pace in uh, in other parts of the world, which is now the India, for example, is the current epicentre of the pandemic, which we looked at in some detail yesterday. OK, that'll do for today. Otherwise, I'll just prattle on too long. So thank you for watching.